Good morning to our participants and welcome to the 10th session of the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program. This training program is developed by the Legal Education Board in partnership with the Asian Development Bank, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, and the UN Environment Program, PINA. I am Attorney Maria Romina Gumal, Program Coordinator of the Legal Education Board, and I will be your host for today. The topic for today's session is Environmental Law Asia, Environmental Law Academics Panel from Southeast Asia and Opportunities for Comparative Law. Before we get started, for a brief recap of our last session, we discussed the topic how to design an environmental law clinic, the experiences as well as the challenges with our resource speakers, Dr. Georgina Lloyd, UNEP, Attorney Donna Gasgonia, and the Client Earth Lawyers, Joyce, Attorney Joyce Marcartan, and Attorney John Minguito. The topic focused on the discussions on how to set up an environmental law clinic, as well as the experiences and the challenges of an existing environmental law clinic in the country, as well as comparison to environmental law clinics around the world. Now, to formally begin our session, let me first go over to our house rules. Kindly mute. Kind of let us know if you would like to record the session today. We will only start recording if all parties consent to the recording. Mute your microphone while waiting for others to join and when not speaking during the session. Kindly use the chat box option if you have any questions or comments. Click the reaction option to interact with our speakers and guests. Turn off your video camera after the taking of the picture to lessen the amount of bandwidth and for everyone in the meeting. The links to the registration form as well as on the evaluation form will be sent in our chat box. Kindly check your chat box and fill out the registration form to confirm your attendance. The evaluation form will also be sent to your email after today's session. We will also be having a reflective journal to record our participants' learning experience. Reflection is, a vital, is vital to the learning process and reflection on the sessions that you have undergone in the Environmental Law Faculty Training Program will give all of you the opportunity to explore why you are participating in this program. Thus, we prepared the reflective journal in Google Form. We encourage all of you to accomplish the reflective journal the reflections will also be used as feedback and evaluation for the sessions you have attended and will guide us as we prepare for the next activity. The links to the reflective journal we both will be posted in our chat box. Lastly, we would like to invite everyone to join our Facebook page, Envilaw Asia, to see the latest update and environmental law activities, training, and engage with other fellow environmental law advocates. All right. So... Let me first introduce to you our first resource speaker for today's session. We have with us Associate Professor Jonathan Lajuvat. Jonathan received a PhD and JD from the University of Southern California, an MS from the University of Washington, and a BS from California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. His research largely focuses on the rule of law with these studies from human rights and environmental issues. His fieldwork is mostly in Myanmar. Generally, his research falls within the fields of international law, rule of law, human rights, environmental law, law and development, and law of society. Due to the empirical nature of his research, his work co connects academia, government, and civil society, and seeks in interdisciplinary transboundary and cross-cultural collaborations. It also endeavors to nurture direct impact upon policymakers and societal leaders. He was born in Myanmar, but grew up in Sweden and the United States. He received an Endeavor Research Grant in 2018 and was a Fulbright Scholar in 2014 to 2015. He is currently working on projects supported by the International Commission of Jurists, Danish Institute of Human Rights, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, and the United Nations Development Program. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome once again to our virtual session, Dr. Jonathan Lejublat. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Maria. Um, and sorry for uh, logging in just a little bit late. I was having some computer issues uh, here. But um, let me just um, share my screen. Um, 
if that's okay. I just I want to use my PowerPoint and then, uh, okay. Okay, so um, basically today I'm focusing on um, teaching environmental law or inter international environmental law within Myanmar. And so I'm just drawing upon my experiences uh, teaching in the country and um, to give a breakdown as to some of the issues that I encountered and then some of the responses or solutions that I attempted. Um, what you see here is a picture of uh, students that I had in the country. Um, and these were uh, students from University of Yangon, uh, the law school. And um, as some of you may notice that it's predominantly women. So uh, within uh, Myanmar, at the, the law program, uh, law students, um, it's about 90% women. Uh, it's only 10% men. Um, there are certain reasons uh, for that, uh, but um, you know, I can we can discuss this in a few minutes. But it basically it means that there's a certain kind of a cohort that you get uh, when you're uh, dealing with law students, and then more importantly, there's a certain kind of a cohort that you get when you're dealing with topics of uh, international environmental law, uh, international human rights, um, these kinds of, of subjects. Um, the other thing I'll mention here before I uh, forget is that uh, in Myanmar, uh, they use an older model of uh, university education that, that was inherited from the British. And um, this was a model that still goes through the K through 10 system and then goes to university. So a lot of the law students and university students in general that I had, um, they were coming, their first year of university started at the age of 16 and they were graduating by the age of 20 or 21. All right. Um, generally, the theme that I sort of want to highlight today is the tension between the arguments about exceptionalism versus globalism. So for those of us who are coming from an international environmental law perspective, uh, we're effectively representing uh, a global level discourse about um, uh, the environment. Um, in contrast, when going to places like Myanmar, and I recognize this is not just specific to Myanmar, but this is something that's true for many countries, there's always this perspective of exceptionalism that um, there's something that has to be done specific or unique to the, to the context of the country. Um, and you know, the, the political, legal, economic, social uh, background specific to the country. And uh, one of the things that I just wanna point out here is that there is a danger that if you try to respect too much of, of the local uh, framework, that there is no propagation of international knowledge, skills, or values. And that we're having to make these choices about, you know, what is it that we're trying to convey from an international perspective and how do we do that? Um, given um, the local uh, exceptionalism, so the Myanmar way. Uh, we are in effect uh, trying to change the status quo. Uh, people who are asking for uh, assistance, capacity building assistance are asking for something that can change the status quo. Um, and so then what are we doing and how do we do that? And so those are the, that's sort of the larger ulterior question that I have uh, for everyone today. Jonathan, it's, uh, Matthew here. Um, yeah. Your screen is in presenting mode, so it's not quite full screen, the slides. Okay. Um, let me see if I can make that full screen. Um, um, sorry. Um, um, I'm not quite sure how to they swap they swap presenter view and slideshow. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there we go. Thank All right. Thanks, Carl. Okay. Um, so when we're challenging the status quo, you know, wh what does this mean? Right. And uh, so what I encountered when I was getting going into Myanmar was that um, environmental law, the topic of environmental law is actually a, a very risky politically risky proposition, just given the history of, the, of, of uh, environmental conservation in the country. Um, generally speaking, uh, there's a colonial legacy that was very much tied to fortress conservation. So fortress conservation, the idea here was that uh, you would treat the environment as sort of this pristine uh, resource. Uh, you would uh, 
evict all people from the land and, and from um, uh, the forests and, and the waters, and then basically make uh, the environment a reserve. And only people with a certain level of privilege would have access uh, to the reserve. And this basically meant that the environment was, was the domain of the elite. Uh, so when the, when, the, when the colonists or the colonial administrations left, it left a, a very convenient mechanism for, um, for political elites, domestic political elites to take over. In the case of Myanmar, uh, as of the 1962 military coup, it then became um, a mechanism for military domination of the environment. The other thing that occurred was that, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Myanmar has effectively been a constant conflict zone throughout its entire post-independence history. There's always been some uh, battle or, or taking place somewhere in the country over the course of the past 70 or so years. And the environment has been a weapon. Uh, the environment is, is basically a resource that uh, armed forces can use to finance uh, weapons flows. You know, you can, you can cut down uh, tea, you can cut down uh, rosewood, um, you can go ahead and sell all of, all of that to gain revenue to buy weapons. It's also a weapon, in, uh, the environment is a weapon in the sense that by destroying the environment, you're, you're depriving certain ethnic groups of their lands, their means of subsistence, their territory, and then also their cultures. Uh, you know, most of uh, the concentration of Myanmar's natural resources are within the ethnic areas, so on the frontiers in the west, north, east, and south. Um, and then these are the places where you see the highest levels uh, of conflict. Um, currently, uh, we can see this even now with, with the recent coup of February 2021, um, the environment has is, is become a revenue stream. So uh, the Environmental Investigative Agency, or EIA, has noted an increase in, uh, in uh, deforestation, an increase in poaching, an increase in mining, an increase um, in, uh, in, in uh, hydropower projects in the country. So basically um, the military coup has accelerated uh, environmental uh, de uh, deterioration in Myanmar. And all of this is meant to create additional revenue streams uh, for the military enterprises. So uh, the analogy that I give to everyone is that uh, ever since the 1980s, uh, Myanmar's military has adopted the Indonesian or the Egyptian model, where the military is embedded itself as the owners of major sectors of the economy, um, you know, construction, hotels, tourism, um, these kinds of things, and uh, natural resource-related industries are no exception. Um, something that's been a major issue as of late, within the past 10 years, everyone has always complimented, complimented Myanmar on its um, uh, enthusiastic dedication to international environmental instruments, but this has actually been a process of greenwashing, so um, that uh, the, the state uses its obligations to the UNFCCC, the Convention on Biological Diversity, etc., as justification to dispossess people of land. Um, again, following the history of fortress conservation, um, the state argues that the only way it can meet its international obligations to international environmental treaties is to take land and water away from people and to put it under the control of the, of the centralized state, um, which you know, might be fine for some political context, but in a place like Myanmar with an authoritarian legacy, um, this basically means that there's little space for critical analysis, and instead the expectation is that there's just blind obedience. Um, for those of us who are trying to promote international environmental law, uh, this means that we're actually challenging the status quo. We're a threat to the status quo because we're encouraging nature-culture connections. We're getting away from fortress conservation. We're getting away from purely uh, monetary related valuations in the environment. We're looking at things in terms of ecosystem services, intrinsic value. We're trying to uh, get away from instrumental uses of the environment uh, by trying to apply science and traditional knowledge. Uh, we're looking for good governance and rights-based approaches. So we're trying to be very sensitive to these issues about um, authoritarianism, greenwashing, um, and, and illicit uses of the environment. So these are things that uh, by the nature of our field, we are challenging the status quo. When I arrived at the universities, um, I found an additional problem there beyond just the, the subject matter. 
There was also the condition of the universities. Uh, so those of you who are coming from developing countries, uh, th these issues are probably no surprise, but uh, for those of you in the audience who are coming from more Western uh, first world or global North backgrounds, um, these are things that you should be very much aware of, that there are certain assumptions that uh, I think most people uh, from wealthier countries assume. Uh, you know, when, th when they hear the word university or someone from the United States, Australia, hears the word university, they, they think of a campus that has uh, technology, infrastructure, academic freedom, where there's um, a lot of people engaged in, in research and teaching, where they go to global conferences, they're, they're talking to global partners. Um, and they, you know, in, in your mind, you're, you're naming any number of world famous institutions as, as your model, right? And what you're trying to aspire to towards. In contrast, when I arrived in, uh, in Myanmar in 2014 um, and saw, you know, and, and went to the universities and actually started teaching there, um, Myanmar, you could see, had suffered from decades of, 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 of constriction in, in support for education. Um, Myanmar, as a, as a state, uh, for the better part of 40 or 50 years, uh, had spent the lowest percentage of its per, uh, of, I mean, lowest percent of its annual GDP on education compared to other countries in ASEAN. Um, so this basically left uh, the universities uh, destitute. So you would, you know, there was a lack of money. Um, there was uh, inconsistent electricity. Uh, when I arrived in 2014, there was no internet. Uh, the textbooks that were there were the same textbooks they've been using since the 1970s. Um, it, you had a colonial era architecture. So, um, it's a, it was, you know, beautiful colonial buildings that had been left by the British, but they hadn't been updated or renovated since the departure of the British. So, you know, just imagine that you're stepping back into time in the 1940s and that nothing had changed and you add an additional 60 years of aging on top of that. And that's basically what you can visualize. The other thing too, is the conception of a university uh, was I think a reflection of the colonial era conception of a university where um, it was not really about research. It was much more focused on teaching. Um, and unfortunately the nature of teaching was much more about uh, uh, supporting state authority. So this meant no critical analysis and meant rote memorization. It meant classrooms where the teacher would talk and then the, uh, they would read a sentence and then the students would recite the sentence back. Um, so this was the nature of university education uh, when I first arrived. And so this was a very different worldview uh, a different understanding of the concept of a university uh, when I arrived. And so the, the way I des describe uh, things to people is, um, you know, Myanmar, so uh, the United Kingdom uh, and other countries started to close off access uh, and or engagement with Myanmar universities around the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, so how much has, or how much have global discourses and different disciplines changed since that time? You know, how much has the field of economics changed since 1970? How much has the field of feminism changed since 1970? How much has the field of, of environmental science changed since 1970? And so this is, you know, this is the kind of gap um, that uh, I was having to overcome when I first arrived there. Um, on top of that, there's just a larger question about the nature of aid and how aid is delivered. Um, and here, uh, you know, quite often I was going through uh, aid organizations. I was, you know, it's my, my travel, uh, my visas were being uh, provided uh, under the support of international aid organizations. But the problem was that aid organizations, generally speaking, are not conducive to the timeframes, the mindset, the context of universities that um, most aid organizations, they deal with very short-term project cycles on a quarterly basis. Uh, capacity building workshops are quite often just you know, uh, two weeks at the most, usually more like five days. It's all donor driven where it's constantly competing for donors. So you know, there's no uh, guarantee that uh, aid will be sustained, that it'll be continued, there's, which means that there's no guarantee that engagement will continue. And, um, in the opposition to that, the local context is this huge scale of problems. I'm not going to read all of these here, but you know, that's, you have an incredibly uh, unstable political environment with um, with a with a state that has suffers from uh, high levels of underdevelopment, um, high levels of conflict. You have an authoritarian legacy which still permeates the culture and the society. Um, 
there's very much a predatory uh, nature of leadership because it's a patron client system where everyone uh, tries to uh, satisfy um, the leader and the leader in turn uh, doles out rewards. So anyone who engages in any kind of questioning or critical analysis is automatically deemed a challenge to authority and you're automatically punished as a result of that. The other component is the fact that the military is, was, was and is always lurking in the background and the military always maintains uh, itself the right to take over the country, which is exactly what happened this past February, 2021. Um, and the military, their attitude is, um, you know, power comes from the barrel of a gun. And that, you know, whatever happens, they, they can always just simply show up, shut everything down, kick everyone out, um, and then and resume control. What does not help is that um, the military and um, large factions of the political system in Myanmar tend to be incredibly xenophobic. They don't like foreign ideas. They don't like foreign intervention. And as a result, they're incredibly suspicious of anything that is coming from outside of Myanmar or is representing a perspective that's different from Myanmar. Um, uh, let me just get to the last slide. So this, I'll finish with this. And so, you know, what I did on a personal level um, and what I chose to do to try and, and promote the teaching of international environmental law. Um, I stepped outside of the aid industry. I, I started working just as a, as a person. I volunteered my time. Um, it's it, one of the things that, uh, that was sig of a significant help was that um, um, there were people inside me on my government, within the Ministry of Education, within the Yangon University, um, and even within the law school who had gone to boarding school with my mother, they knowed my mom since they were five years old. Um, and they allowed me to go ahead and uh, teach uh, one semester every year. And um, the reasoning I think being was that there was a sense on their part that if there was ever any danger, if they ever felt that there was a danger by some foreigner teaching something as provocative as international environmental principles, they could call my mom and tell me to just stop. They, could, they, they, had a, um, they had a break that they could just, if they ever got scared, they could just simply uh, contact my mom and then basically press the brake pedal. And this actually happened several times when uh, my mom would call me up uh, and have a Skype session and ask me what it, what it was that I was doing and what it was that I was teaching. And basically I then knew that there was a signal that they were, we were doing something that was dangerous or risky and I had to stop. Um, I will tell you that um, there, were, there were two occasions where I was contacted by military intelligence. They actually uh, came and uh, visited my office at, in the law school and asked me out for tea. And um, they were very polite conversations, um, very delicate. But you know, the, the, the way I responded to this is that you know, knowledge is meant to be shared. Um, I'm just simply presenting international perspectives. I'm trying to help uh, locals understand what all the foreigners are talking about, that they, they can always choose to just simply reject anything that I was teaching, that, that this was not a problem. I would not be offended by this. Um, and that I was just simply uh, providing knowledge and I was willing to share that knowledge with everyone. And that included anyone who was in the military. Right. So that was generally the way I was framing. So I was relying upon the framing. I was relying upon the social capital I had through my family connections. Um, and then I was also trying to act as a matter of pro, on a pro bono basis where I was donating textbooks, articles, all the resources that I had. And then probably most significantly, and this is something I always stress to people, um, I was engaging in long term sustained engagement that shared risks and shared rewards. I was present to share whatever dangers that people on the ground were encountering. I was also physically present to share or help them uh, with any rewards that they were trying to seek in terms of trying to get uh, international support, in terms of trying to encourage reforms, um, in terms of trying to get a greater uh, connection to international environmental principles. Um, and so, this was generally the approach that I adopted. It didn't require a lot of money, but it, take, it did require a lot of sweat equity. Um, and it did require me basically uh, uh, providing a whole bunch of things um, as a matter of goodwill. So I'll just stop my presentation there um, and I'll uh, allow the other presenters to talk. And I guess we can then have some Q&A afterwards. But uh, thanks for your time.
Thank you, Dr. Jonathan, for sharing your personal experience in your pursuit in teaching environmental law in Myanmar. You're very courageous in your advocacy to educate those who are in your country who are illiterate. So I guess um, we all commend you in some way. I hope everyone can, can, be, can be inspired by your story. And now we move forward and continue our discussion with our second resource speaker. So our, our second resource speaker is Dr. Hanim Kamarudi. Dr. Hanim is currently serving as the Deputy, Deputy Dean Academic Affairs and a Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Law University, Kebang San, Malaysia. She received LLB degree in the University of Kebang San, Saan, Malaysia, in which she wrote a final year thesis on the effectiveness of environmental impact assessment from a legal standpoint in Malaysia. In 1996, she was called to the Malaysian Bar as a qualified advocate and solicitor of Malaya. She further obtained a master's degree in the legal aspect of Marine Affairs and University of Wales in Cardiff in 1997, where she wrote a thesis on management of Straits of Malacca from Malaysia's legal standpoint. She obtained her PhD degree in law from the University of Malaya, focusing on research in the legal aspect of transboundary haze pollution in Malaysia. She teaches environmental law, international environmental law, torts, and remedies. Dr. Hani was also an active member in the disciplinary board of Bar Council in Malaysia, a certified mediator, a Malaysia and Malaysia country focal person for Asian Development Bank, strengthening environmental law, train the trainers program. She has published a book entitled The Environmental Quality Act, 1974 Statutory Instruments and Amendments in 2016. She is also a visiting professor of Faculty of Law in Hassan, Has, Hassanuddin University, Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our, our second research speaker, Dr. Hanin Kamaruddin. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, very good morning. Uh, to respected trainers and participants of Philippines uh, Environmental Law Teachers Online Teaching Program 2021. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to apologize. Um, I do not have any PowerPoint um, uh, for my presentation today, and I shall be focusing more on the um, pedagogy, um, which I cannot profess to be an expert on, but I think I can share a thing or two, uh, or two um, for you to consider in your um, in your teaching, yeah, in your environmental law teaching. So, my focus for today will be slightly different from uh, Dr. Jonathan's, and I hope that you um, you know take a listen to what I I can share with you today. And uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate again the organizers of this training program, Asian Development Bank, uh, Philippines Legal Education Board. Uh, UNEP and IUCN Academy of uh, Environmental Law for again successfully and continuously providing training for environmental law teachers to improve their teaching techniques and updating knowledge. Um, this is such a commendable uh, effort. Uh, I, I believe this, uh, I don't know, this is probably, um, probably the ninth or the eighth, I'm not sure, because the last one was in India, if I'm not mistaken, Matthew. Uh, Maria, and uh, a while back, and that was a while back, it was in uh, 2016, where Malaysia had its first TTT uh, organized uh, by ADB and University Kebangsaan and Malaysia. So thank you to uh, Matthew Baird and the organize, uh, organizers for inviting me to speak in this session. I will do my best to impart or highlight certain practices which I have adopted or adapted to ensure that um, my students receive uh, as much knowledge uh, within the 40 week, 14 weeks in one semester and uh, hopefully to give them enough to apply that knowledge and I hope I can share some insights with you today. So in this particular segment, I was told and from the itinerary, um, I've gathered that um, all speakers are requested to convey their insights and best practices in environmental law teachings. Um, so this, you know, this is what I understood from the, uh, the, the itinerary that uh, were given to us. So basically, um, I'm looking at the area of what works in teaching, yeah? And perhaps uh, suggesting um, some effective mechanisms that would encourage and reward 
um, eff effective teaching practices on the basis of student learning outcomes. So naturally, all of us here are teachers and lecturers of um, environmental law, teaching um, at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels, I believe. And we all have different ways of teaching. Yeah, so that is quite natural. So my session for this morning will be a rather concise one, uh, but hopefully I can provide with some insights on how to better impart your knowledge <clears throat> or to educate your students um, in environmental law. Uh, but to be honest, um, at a personal level, um, I'm a person that was not equipped um, to teach. Yeah, um, I was not educated as a teacher. I had no diploma in teaching. I actually jumped into teaching immediately after graduating, uh, taking as much um, um, you know, uh, experiences from being taught by another teacher. So that was what I knew then. And um, over the years, you know, you begin to kind of uh, look at the, uh, you know, what, what are the right tools, uh, what are the right mechanisms, um, and what are the relevant knowledge that you need to update all the time to teach environmental law. Um, and, you know, at first, um, I was in odds as well because I didn't have all those tools. And uh, after a while, I've picked up over the years, over, well, probably over 25 years, I picked up what methods do work, at least for me, at least in my experience. So I will highlight um, my experience in two areas. Namely, the first one would be, what are the suitable methods? Well, at least the ones that I know, that I have used in my teaching over the past many, many years to achieve learning objectives in environmental law teaching. So as teachers, I think that's, that's rather pertinent and I think that's quite a concern to many of us, whether or not our teaching actually relays the, the, the messages or information that you need to convey to, the, your, to your students. Second area which I thought I can impart is how we can extend our teachings beyond borders of our four walls. Now, when I say beyond our four walls, I mean using more than the usual resources than we are normally provided within our universities, and also how we can make the teaching experience much more meaningful by including laws on environmental protection in other countries, especially for comparative study. And I think um, many of us here uh, will use examples from or illustrations from other countries' cases in order to make it more interesting and, and more meaningful. Yeah when we teach our students. So before I begin, I think in hindsight, um, I think throughout our journey as teachers, um, we sometimes, well, at least I sometimes, uh, tend to think that our teaching is enough, is sufficient yeah, to convey uh, uh, information to educate our students. Um, but, you know, um, after receiving such training like what you have you are receiving right now, um, this, this remarkable opportunity that this particular program provides us. And, and for me, yeah, and for me, because the last one which I attended was actually in 2016, and it was the first one where ADB had actually conduct, conducted this kind of a training. And uh, that was a face-to-face -face and was done in Manila. And I must say that in more many ways than one, um, we know that there are more techniques that we can utilize, new information that we can use during our lectures. Now, this program, I think the one that we are, uh, ADB is conducting now, in my, in my personal view, really connect us to our counterparts from other universities in our own countries. And I believe that there are 70 participants here from all over Philippines. And, uh, and um, you know, you can use your connections uh, from abroad and we should benefit that, you know, from the teachers that we connect with, either in your program or in this particular program or those that you have known um, previously, yeah, and, and, and perhaps in the future to come. So the methods uh, to achieve this, I will share with you in a minute. So we go back to the first issue or area of what is a suitable method or methods really depend on your expected or required goals to make your students learn. 
So this would be a reflection on your performer, um, performer of your subject on environmental law, international environmental law, and uh, or climate change law. Yeah. So the the method which I use perhaps may not be strange to many of you, but um, Firstly, you must make sure that the course objectives or goals are clear. What do you expect of a student to understand at the end of the course is imperative. So you need to know then how to achieve your course content and aligning them with appropriate activities and methods of assessment. And I'm sure that we do this by using Bloom's taxonomy. So this is another, another exercise or, or, or practice that, that, that I uh, learned, had to learn very quickly yeah? in order to come up or design your course um, content. And again, this would depend on the degree level that you are teaching. So I'll give you an example. Um, let us take the postgraduate degree level. Now at this point, we do not only expect the students to remember, to understand and apply, but in, an, in addition to analyze and evaluate laws. So basically postgraduate students must be able to critically examine information and make judgments from what they have gathered and analyzed. So in other words, at the end of the course, they are able to justify their position or a stand using methods that include elements of defending, arguing, supporting after comparing or contrasting or questioning information. So those are some of the keywords that, you, you know, that you're aware of. So after clearing what is needed for effective learning based on Bloom's taxonomy, you can then devise learning mechanisms or activities that will fulfill that learning outcomes by engaging students through various forms you have chosen for such purpose. So in this regard, I've used several methods and I'm still uh, using them whenever I can, um, but it's quite challenging right now because um, you know, we, we only have um, online teaching, face-to-face uh, -face have yet been delayed once again in Malaysia. As you all know that we are currently facing a new threat, a new variant of um, COVID-19, the Omicron. So again, once again, um, even though the university has the vision to open up the, the, the universities in full by next semester, but I think uh, they'll be delayed once again. So some of the top methods on my list, yeah. Um, the first one being role play. Now role play is, I, I, I like this method, yeah. This is an effective teaching method uh, activity which um, clearly displays uh, student learning of the specified knowledge and skills required in their given role. So I have carried out several mediation exercises in my lectures and have shown that students' performances are enhanced as they are heavily invested in the process of remembering, understanding, applying the laws in mock mediation. So what I'll do after that is after the whole exercise, I would request them to give some kind of a reflection on what they have carried out during the whole process. Um, and, and from that process, you'll be able to see that they are able to analyze and, um, you know, um, and, and evaluate their performances in accordance with what the role play expect from, uh, from them in terms of resolving legal issues. So I would carry this out normally at the undergraduate levels. But uh, mind you, I did not use this method at first. Um, I learned this actually from the first DTT program, uh, which I mentioned earlier, way back in 2015. Um, but I find that this method is really rewarding, uh, where I see students using their legal knowledge and playing the part of a lawyer or advisor, and actually can be quite entertaining. Um, usually, um, when we have this kind of an exercise, I will record the whole session, and we'll be able to, you know, play back and actually see where we've gone wrong, you know, what are the um, uh, questions that we should have asked, uh, or, you know, what could have made it better. Um, the second method, which I, I think all of us have used this, is actually to ask them to carry out projects 
Now, projects is something I normally instruct to my students at the postgraduate level uh, to carry out as part of the assessment. There are two parts to this. Uh, usually, um, the first part will consist of the actual written assignment and the practical side of the learning activities to present the outcome of their findings. Now, what I would normally require from them is to make uh, comparisons in other jurisdictions in relation to the subject area. Then they are able to um, process and distinguish laws in different countries and to seek out why these laws may be different. You know, um, it really goes back to the uh, history, uh, historical background, the culture, religion, and so forth. So it is actually going beyond the law itself, which is needed in, in learning about everything about the protection of the environment. So that's crucial. So whenever I, 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 I um, begin my first class, I would normally go back into the um, historical background of the country first and to relate that to what's happening, you know, or why was this law developed uh, at a certain time and it has a lot to do with the industry or the development of, of, of a country. And uh, that I think you need to um, make sure that the, un the students would, you know, the students understand as to why the laws are, are there to begin with. Uh, there must be some background to the, to the um, evolution of the laws yeah, or environmental laws in a country. Now, the third one, which um, I quickly had to adopt is um, ever since the pandemic came on in 2020, yeah, is the obviously online classroom quizzes and tests. Now, this is something um, which I have carried out uh, numerous times is basically to get some clues on whether they know of such scenarios and laws related in Malaysia um, before or after the actual lecture. Um, so this I find uh, quite suitable to engage students that somehow seem missing from our screens, yeah? Uh, just to make sure that they are there. So you come up with this, you know, surprise quizzes, surprise uh, short tests and things like that, just to make them aware that, you know, this is a class. I, I think many of you, um, you know, have encountered this where everybody goes missing, yeah? Um, and somehow we feel that we're talking to ourselves, yeah? But this is one thing that you can do, you can consider in trying to engage a student uh, before class or after class. For this, I have uh, used a couple of platforms. I'm sure you've heard of, um, you know, um, either I use normally uh, Google Forms, which I am sure that many of you are aware of. And um, there's another uh, platform which I use, which is an interactive presentation software, which is called Centimeter. Now, of course, for this purpose, uh, you will need to come up with your own set of questions uh, related to the course content uh, that you're teaching. And um, another advice, uh, since we are using a lot of te technology, uh, technology these days, uh, I would recommend videos on a particular subject area or topic. So this can be um, viewed before you begin a class and also after class, which you can use um, you know, the quick quiz that I mentioned earlier, uh, where they are you know, to assess where they are at in learning the specific content. So this is actually to assist students um, to get a strong foundation in that particular aspect of law. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to the second part of the sharing session is basically to suggest to you that you can consider using external resources to enhance your teaching method. You know, to, to ensure that the learning or the goals of your um, uh, teaching is achieved. So um, when I, it goes back to the second um, area that I mentioned to you earlier about going beyond the four walls. So in this sense, I have actually linked up with several teachers of environmental law in Malaysia, as well as abroad, yeah? So I've done uh, various exercises with my friends uh, because in Malaysia, ever since we, um, um, this is actually the result of the uh, first TPT in Malaysia in 2015, where we formed a group of environmental law teachers. We are known as environmental law friends, ELFs. Um, their acronym is ELFs uh, and it was formed in um, 2016. 
comprising of um, environmental law lecturers in Malaysia. Uh, and mind you, we don't have many in Malaysia. Um, and I'm very, very happy to know that in Philippines, there are many, many of you who are actually, you know, teaching environmental law. We don't have that many. Probably the most is 15. Out of all the universities in Malaysia, we only have 15. Um, so in this particular uh, uh, practice, we normally reach out to each other if we require assistance in not only teaching, but also for research and consultation, including getting advice on how to improve or construct a new program. So this is an avenue to liven up your lectures by inviting them as guest speakers and uh, not limited to them. You can call upon lawyers. Yeah, um, I do that sometimes. Um, you know, uh, uh, guest speakers from business sectors, the judiciary, and the NGOs. So the, it is crucial that after this training, my dear participants, my dear teachers, that you know about seventy of you initiate something. Um, that would bind yourselves together in the aim to strengthen environmental law teaching in the Philippines. And you will find a wealth of resources. So the second one is, uh, which I would like to relate to you, is what I call the Hassanuddin experience. As you know, I am the uh, visiting professor for the last two years. Um, I have another two years um, to be the visiting professor at Hassanuddin University in Makassar, Indonesia. So one of my roles is actually to teach, obviously and to do research uh, with um, um, the um, academ uh, academics and students in Hassanuddin. And normally I would embed comparative study between Malaysia and Indonesia, at the very least, uh, in areas that I teach, such as human rights and the environment. And um, I'm into plastic laws right now, so we have um, sessions on plastic laws. So that is one of the ways where um, that I can suggest is uh, for all of you to get together to create networks. Uh, not just domestically, but also abroad to help you in your teaching, especially, you know, especially when you wish to convey uh, similarities or differences uh, in managing the environment in other jurisdictions from the legal aspects. Another initiative which I have um, came up with is actually to assist the students. I think um, I did mention to Matthew uh, a while back that you know, yeah, it's challenging, yes, but you know, we have to make a start. Um, in order to make it a, a more student-centric um, exercise um, and, and, and with this, um, to help them along in achieving their learning goals in environmental law course, um, where you can design kind of a platform or a forum to encourage students to speak out or discuss on various environmental law topics. And I've always been concerned when students are not able to do that and can only do so if there is a conference or seminar and they're working with their professors. So in this case, um, with a lot of help from my friends from India, Indonesia and the Philippines. So I thank you, Prof. Liz, uh, Liz, uh, Rose, uh, Lisa Rose and assistance from the Students' Law Society in UKM. Um, we have come up with a special seminar just for students where the presenters are, you know, students themselves speak on the given theme. So it is uh, the first global law issue seminar, which is going to be held on 11th December 2021. Um, I'm happy to say that the theme is on environmental law. Um, so hopefully the students will learn from such programs uh, whereby learning is not limited to only our lectures. So I hope I've done justice to the topic this morning by sharing what I know, um, what I have practiced so far. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Dr. Hanin, for sharing your experiences and best practices in teaching environmental law thank you. and making the subject more meaningful and engaging. Um, I guess our participants can truly relate and can adopt some of your practices if they are applicable here in the Philippines. So let's now move on to the third resource speakers for today's session. So. For our third resource speaker, we will have today Dr. Nupur Chaudhari. He is an, she is an assistant professor of law at the Center for the Study of Law and Governance in Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, India. She completed her BA in Political Science in Delhi University and LLB from the Campus Center Faculty of Law in Delhi University.
she also has an LLM in International and European Law in the University of Amsterdam and a PhD in Law and Regulation from the University of Twenty Netherlands. Prior to this, prior to this, she was an assistant professor at the Jinhao Global Law Schools and associate fellow at the Resources and Global Security Division, the Energy Resources Institute. She teaches courses on political science, such constitution history, research methodology, environmental law, and law and technology. She has undertaken research projects in natural resources, environmental impact assessments, health regulation, and regulation of emerging technology. She is a member of the IUCN Commission on Environmental Law and of the Terry Institutional Ethics Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Nupur Chaudhary. Good morning to you, Doctor. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction uh, and uh, to all of the participants. Uh, it's a really an honor and a privilege to be here to speak with you today morning, and also to my uh, co-panelists, Jonathan and uh, Hani. They've set it up quite beautifully for me to come in and share my thoughts on why we should be, as law teachers, uh, specifically environmental law teachers, we should be adopting a more comparative perspective to teach and research on environmental law, specifically in the context of Asia. So that's what my presentation today is going to be. I just would like to also uh, take this moment to thank the organizers, the law, Philippine Law Education Board, and also the EDP and UNEP, and specifically Matthew, for uh, inviting me for this uh, panel. Uh, so the presentation, as I mentioned today, uh, I would like to emphasize and give you my perspective or some insights about why we need to adopt the comparative lens. Uh, it's not something, just something, an academic interest, but it's something very critical to how we look at or how we imagine environmental law to be. Uh, I would uh, try and convince you, or my proposition is today that I don't think environmental law can be taught it in any other way, but through a comparative lens. So my presentation today would focus on four aspects. What do I mean when I say that we need to adopt a comparative law lens to teach environmental law? Uh, what is the utility of adopting this approach? Uh, both in terms of teach teaching as well as research. And if you are convinced about the objective of, uh, of adopting such a comparative law lens, how do we go about doing it, actually doing it? And I would uh, finally end with sharing some insights about uh, the South Asia Research Colloquium that we uh, just tried to organize and we're trying to do a little bit. Part of our work is to contribute to this objective of comparative law. Right. So what do I mean when I say uh, a comparative law lens? Uh, very minimally, it means that while approaching any legal issue, as Hani mentioned quite uh, clearly, it means you are attentive. When you approach any legal issue, you are, uh, should be attentive to the similarities and differences on how that specific issue is dealt in different jurisdictions. Right. Uh, so so what do you have to be attentive to then? Uh, so for example, if you take up something like uh, environmental impact assessment, you're teaching environmental impact assessment, then yeah, one of the questions to ask yourself is that how is environmental impact assessment regulated in other jurisdictions? Is it similar and how is it different to how it, how it is regulated in your own jurisdiction, right? So. One aspect is to actually track legislation and case law on the issue. The other aspect is also to track scholarship. What are the other researchers in other jurisdictions writing on that subject, right? And uh, as Hanim quite rightly mentioned, it's not possible to just, uh, you know, have, uh, say for example, you have the Philippine uh, law on environmental impact assessment, and then you have another law, say from India or Indonesia, on environmental impact assessment. 
you need to also research a bit of the background. How did the law come into being? What are the historical antecedents of that law, right? So to give a more fuller perspective, right, on the issue, how the law developed, right? So these are certain aspects that you need to be cognizant of, right? So that very briefly what the meaning of adopting a comparative law lens is. Now, before I move forward, just very briefly, you know, comparative law as an academic project is quite old, right? And the primary uh, driver for that project was that you had legal, the whole legal systems approach, right? You had different uh, jurisdictions in the world were divided up in terms of the kind of legal systems they had. So you had a very uh, simplistically, you had at least two legal systems, right? The common law and the civil law legal systems, right? So the, the historically, the comparative law project has been to uh, kind of bunch up countries in terms of their historical legal systems and then study the differences and commonalities between them. But I think uh, moving forward, I think it's important to also look at uh, why in environmental law specifically you need a comparative law lens, right? And it's not necessarily that you follow a legal systems approach. So countries which have common law, you will only compare those countries which have common law systems and not compare a common law country with a civil law country. I don't think that kind of a difference uh, is of much use or relevance, specifically when you teach environmental law. And I'll come to that in the next slide. So what is the utility of uh, teaching comparative law, specifically environmental law, right? Uh, I don't think, uh, I, I think you would agree if I were to say that environmental issues are not jurisdiction specific, right? There are often shared and similar problems of environment across jurisdictions, right? So there is much, therefore, there is much to learn from how the same problem have been, has been addressed in other jurisdictions, right? Uh, we are also at a very important cusp of a geological approach. I'm sure some of you at least have heard about this term Anthropocene. The fact that we are at a stage where, uh, you know, human intervention in the environment is of such great scale that the environment or the geology is completely changed. And we are actually heading for a, a huge disaster, right? And the climate change and all these other antecedent problems lends urgency to this uh, whole project of adopting a comparative law lens that we need to find solutions urgently to environmental problems together. And one way to do it is by learning and discussing with each other. So that is why it's very critical to, for peer-to-peer -peer learn, learning, right? The second important aspect is that we are all Asian countries, right? And then we face, therefore, we, being uh, in the same continent, we face similar socioeconomic conditions, right? Uh, and that means that what, if we were to learn from another neighboring country within the same continent, the possibility of finding solutions to a certain problem are much more sustainable rather than, say, uh, learning from, taking a learning from another country with very different socioeconomic conditions, right? Uh, also, I feel that academics are particularly suited for this task or this project of comparative law uh, because they are not restricted to this idea of national interests, you know, which may impede the resolution of environmental issues. Like, for instance, you know, you see judges uh, now in more and more jurisdictions taking cognizance of developments in other jurisdictions, right? One very good example, it's the uh, rights of nature discourse. I can tell you from, the, from my uh, own jurisdiction in India, uh, the judiciary actually has been much more of a cheerleader for the comparative law project in a way by taking cognizance of developments in other jurisdictions. So uh, rights of nature being recognized in New Zealand through the legislative, to their own domestic legislative framework or the rights of nature being recognized in the Ecuadorian constitution has 
uh, found their way into judicial decisions within India. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, should be an inspire, uh, should inspire academics as well, right? That why it is important that you take cognizance of developments in other jurisdictions as the judges have done, right? So when you uh, teach, what you teach and how you research environmental law has very, very long-term substantive impact, right? So when you teach, uh, you will influence the next generation of environmental lawyers and academics, right? Uh, so how you teach is very, very important, right? So do you include uh, environmental law examples uh, of developments in legislations or case law or research writings from other jurisdictions, right? So their conception of environment itself expands when you make those choices of how you want to teach environmental law. What are the resources you include within your syllabus? Right? Uh, the second aspect is that is research, right? Uh, and what you research and how you research will also impact environmental policy making and judicial decisions across jurisdictions, right? So if you were, let me take an example. If you were to write a paper, say on, um, you have the writ of Kalikasan, right? And if you were to write a paper on the writ of Kalikasan, which, uh, which looks at the writ of Kalikasan, uh, compares it to uh, other kind of writs that are, uh, say the writ of continuing, uh, other kind of writs that may be uh, in uh, circulation in other jurisdictions, right? Uh, that would be an interesting project and that could pave the way for your own judicial, judiciary to take cognizance of these developments, right? So it's also about bringing to the notice of the judiciary, right? Uh, so the research is actually a very, very important component of how you teach environmental law. So I think, that's the basic broader uh, philosophy I think one needs to adopt as environmental law teachers, that we need to expand the imagination of environmental law as not something which is restricted to by national boundaries, right? Because environment is one, we share the earth and whatever little steps that we take in how we teach and research, we need to invite learnings from other jurisdictions because it will enrich our project much more. So uh, I hope I've convinced at least some of you on what is the need, why is there a need to you know, uh, teach environmental law from a comparative perspective. Now, if I were able to convince you, uh, the other important part of the job is to see how do we go about doing it, right? Uh, so just a moment. So uh, let me take a few examples. I've already mentioned it before to you. Uh, in teaching, right? if we adopt a comparative law lens, what do we have to do? Essentially, what we have to do is to track environmental law developments in other jurisdictions and incorporate them in the syllabus. right? For example, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a component in your syllabus on rights of nature, for example, you should be able to track what are the legislations and case laws from other jurisdictions. How are the other jurisdictions discussing the rights of nature debate, right? Or for that matter, EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, or uh, Indigenous People's Rights or Wildlife Protection. All these are really area, uh, you know, areas of teaching or research that are not specific to a jurisdiction, right? So it would be interesting to track developments in other jurisdictions, right? So uh, for example, I would take this opportunity to share with you one recent development, which I think might be of interest to you as environmental law teachers and scholars, is that we recently, uh, as some of you may know, that we have a specialized uh, tribunal, which is called the National Green Tribunal to address environmental disputes, right? It's been around, it's been in operation since 2010. So it's been a uh, little more uh, than a decade since it's been functioning. So one of the important uh, issues that NGT was facing was that its jurisdiction was limited to a certain number of legislations, right? 
and it could not expand its jurisdictions beyond the legislation that were expressly mentioned under the NGT Act, right? Uh, but very recently, as recent as last month, we've had a Supreme Court uh, ruling which says that the NGT now has a sole motor jurisdiction, right? Which means that the NGT on its own uh, can take cognizance of cases that are beyond those acts that are specifically mentioned within under the NGT Act, right? So it's a it's really an interpretation of law that expands the NGT's jurisdiction uh, greatly, right? So in that sense, it's a judicial innovation, actually, right? Where the Supreme Court recognizes that environmental disputes are by nature expensive and cannot be restricted, and therefore the indigenous jurisdiction cannot be restricted. Now, this is a very important development and in India, uh, but it also opens up to questions like, if you're going to look at it from a comparative law lens, that how is it similar to the kind of expansion of jurisdiction like your Supreme Court did when it uh, adopted the writ of Khalifas, right? What are the similar similarities in, uh, in these uh, two developments, right? And how are they different, right? And what can we learn from comparing these two developments? So that's that's an interesting puzzle, and I think that's something that one should uh, explore, right? As environmental law teachers, uh, the other aspect of uh, teaching environmental law through a comparative lens is uh, also to track environmental law scholarship, which means writings of environmental law academics on these issues in other jurisdictions and incorporate them in your syllabus. Uh, now, this is, of course, easier said than done. But say, for example, you were to identify, uh, you were to come across, uh, you're searching for, uh, say, EIA writings from uh, Indonesia, right, while trying to find uh, research published on that issue. Uh, you can also reach out to your uh, peer academics, whoever's written that article, and maybe invite them to have a conversation with you or to give a lecture in your class, right? Something that Hanim had mentioned, right? To have that kind of peer-to-peer -peer contact, uh, not only from those within your jurisdiction, but across jurisdictions, right? Now, one aspect that I wanted to kind of underline is that uh, research and teaching are very much linked. So I don't think you can be good teachers if you don't research on what you teach. So eventually what you teach is what you end up researching on, right? So one way to go about doing this is to establish contact with other environmental academics, right? Sharing and discussing your work. You can suggest possible collaborations in terms of co-authorships, co-organization co of conferences, seminars, panel discussions, research projects, right? So this is one way to link up in terms of research with other academics in other jurisdictions. Right? Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about my own personal insight in this journey. Uh, I think uh, Self-motivation is very important. You have to believe in the utility of adopting a comparative lens because it, of course, requires substantial investment in time, right? So for you to track developments in other jurisdictions or even to do a preliminary search, find out about their background, I mean, how did the law develop or how did the case law emerge? Sorry, was there some disturbance? May I continue? Are you, am I audible? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. So I think that's uh, it requires a lot of investment in time. And uh, so it's quite difficult because obviously if you're teaching, burden is quite high, you might not find the time to do this, right? I think it's important to reach out to uh, senior academics who are already involved in such collaborations, right? So for you, somebody like uh, Lisa would be a great uh, you know, uh, person to, you know, advise you on this, something like that, because she's already part of networks. So something like this uh, becomes much more doable if you take advice from people who are already doing similar work, right? You can also tap into existing networks. The current uh, training program, the ADB TTT network, 
you can identify possible collaborators through that network itself. So I would urge you to go on the ABBTPP network website to see what are the academics uh, on that network, what are the kind of research they are doing, their profiles are updated with their own research, uh, what are the kind of teaching that they are doing. Right? You can reach out through these kind of networks. Uh, my own personal experience uh, suggests that usually, not always, but usually academics don't give a negative response to a peer reaching out, right? So there might be delay, there might be uh, some amount of back and forth, but usually your uh, peer academics, means other researchers and teachers in other jurisdictions are happy to collaborate, are happy to correspond when you reach out to them, right? The other way to uh, you know, track developments is, uh, is through academia and research gate. So once you identify, uh, say, an academic who is working on the area that you're researching on or teaching on, you can actually follow their work in academia and sign up for research updates, right? You can also follow specific journals, like what are the journals that are publishing this kind of comparative law work or even jurisdiction specific work on environmental law and sign up for research alerts, right? So to see what is the kind of research work that is being published, right? So these are some of the ways in which you can, uh, you know, go about doing comparative law work, doing the, this kind of a background. Hmm. So lastly, I just want to come to one of the ways in which uh, I've been involved in trying to expand comparative law research. This is uh, the South Asia Research Colloquium on Environment and Climate Change. This is like uh, what we're trying to do is to three institutions uh, in India, has, uh, they've come together to have a, a mentorship program for younger environmental law academics to publish their research, right? So there is, uh, that includes, uh, involves training in research methods, writing workshops, uh, peer review of their own research articles, and ultimately it leads to journal publication, right? And what is the entire purpose of having such a uh, program, right? Or a colloquium is essentially the main motivation is that environmental law research uh, in Asia needs to be much more diverse and there has to be much more substantive research from the region. Right. So uh, there has to be greater number of voices, greater number of researchers from the region publishing on environmental law in Asia. Right. Uh, so the basic objective is to promote representation. So more number of voices in environmental law from Asia, but at the same time, ensuring research quality. So that's uh, so that therefore there is this mentorship program in which we give intensive peer review comments. Uh, mentor younger law, uh, environmental law academics to uh, speak about their research to, and eventually leading to publication of more research uh, in environmental law from Asian researchers. So that's, uh, so this, is a, this is a experiment of sorts and uh, we hope it succeeds and it leads to more collaborative research. Uh, between younger environmental law scholars. And we hope that this kind of a model can be, if it succeeds, can be of more use and, uh, and be replicated in other jurisdictions. So that's where I end. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Nupur, for, your, for sharing your experiences and your practices in teaching environmental law. We will now move on to the discussion and Q&A to our participants. If you have any questions, you may click the raise hand button, in the reaction function located in the right side of your screen. And you may also send your questions in the chat box and we'll just read it for you. We have with us Matthew to be our moderator. Matthew, the virtual floor Thanks. is yours. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, and thank you very much, Dr. Hanim and Dr. Nepur and Dr. Jonathan for your presentation. Um, I'm opening up for any questions from uh, participants. Um, I, of course, um, as my sort of area of, of research is EIA um, Nepur, I'm very interested in the idea of a comparative EIA um, 
process. And, and um, I'm, I'm also interested just in terms of that comparative environmental law. Do you think it's something that we could um, try to do across Asia and, and Southeast Asia of, of actually like identifying a number of topics um, that we could you know, develop uh, an environmental law academic network around those topics. Um, I, I mean, obviously, climate change uh, is a is an issue um, where you know a lot of the climate change is obviously comparative. Um, but uh, you know, uh, Hanim as well. You know, air pollution is something that impacts on the whole region. Um, Jonathan, you've already presented to our ADB environmental law champions on human rights in the environment, which of course has a significant, you know, comparative norms uh, or international norms. So I'm just, I'm just interested. Do you think there's, uh, is this a, should this be something that could be formalised, or is it more um, informal uh, academics uh, getting together on on particular topics, or do they need some uh, organisation to provide um, a, a bit of that um, that glue to to bring people together? Um, the poor. And thank you, by the way, for getting up very early in India for, for presenting mm -hmm. to us today. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, so I think it's, of course, it's a lot of individual initiative, but I think, you know, like something like the ADB, uh, TTT kind of a thing, what it can do is to actually bring researchers together, you know. So say, for example, if you, as you mentioned, like if you have something like identify like three or four common areas, right? And then uh, invite uh, people to come together and speak from their own jurisdiction specific. And then that can lead to conversations, right? You can actually see what are the, uh, you know, what are the commonalities and differences in a certain scenario that would be really substantive and a learning experience, like even just even our CFPs, you know, we have this annual or whatever, now biannual CFP meetings, right? But we never discuss substantively what is happening in other jurisdictions. Like we never, I would like to know what is happening in Indonesia or Myanmar. Just even, you know, what are the recent developments? You know, what are the recent really uh, important developments or writings or legislations or policies that have been passed, right? That itself, and of course, a much more focused one would be greatly helpful. I mean, you know, just even trying to put the resources together. So I think, yeah, there's a, it's a, there's value in doing something like that. Institutionally, it's very important. Otherwise, we just leave it to individual researchers, and that's very limited time, and this requires investment. Yeah. Hanim, um, I know. I mean, I know because of you know the work you do on on air air pollution in particular, which is a again another. <laughs> area that is of particular interest um, to me and particular relevance to the whole of the region. On the, uh, on the same question? On the yeah, same, yeah, yeah, just on sorry, that. Matthew. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's all right. Um, okay, in Malaysia, we, we, we are rather unique in the sense that um, when it comes to environmental law, we do not have basically, um, like in the Philippines, uh, you know, um, I all, I, I'm always inspired uh, looking at the Philippines experience where you have a lot of advocates, you know, you know, standing up for environmental justice. Whereas in Malaysia, we are poor at that, even if we, we have them, but we are not as vocal as our counterparts in Philippines. And I admire the Philippines, uh, you know, in that sense. Um, so at the end of the day, we are pretty much, um, Cornered with you know just a few of us uh, looking into environmental law from every single aspect there is. Um, amongst us, there are only 15. <clears throat> and even then, um, it's very difficult to get people around uh, certain issues. Um, but I, I take, I echo what Dr. Nopo was saying just now that, you know, um, it takes a lot of time for an individual to come up with something um, worthwhile and I think I don't know perhaps you know I'm just thinking out of, out of the box perhaps ADB could just come up with some kind of a council for the academics you know uh, on environmental law perhaps you know just to coordinate or you know um, aspects of law from different jurisdictions for example so that we can come up with remember Nupo we, 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 we had this we initiated this uh, Asia law 
encyclopedia or something like that. It never took off, right? Right? You know, and it just stopped right there. So there must be some kind of a support, I think. And I think one of those uh, support must come from, I, I suppose, from Christina Peck and the team from Asian Development Bank as a continuation of this, an extension of this program. Uh, to not limit it to just, you know, uh, training, but I think it's to gather all of us under probably a council, I, you may call it council, you know, um, of academics in environmental law. Probably that's one way, Matthew. I, I'm just, you know, um, thinking of the, out of the box, yeah, so that we can get everyone together. And also, um, uh, UN Environment Programme, you know, potentially may also be some um, as, a, as an avenue for that. Um, Jonathan, before I get to you, can I, we've got a question from Jelly Molino and, and then from Professor Galahad. Um, so uh, thank you. Hi, um, good morning. So my question is about um, your methodology in using comparative law in environmental uh, subjects. Are you doing it in the uh, bachelor level of Sorry, we just had a, a freeze. Jilly, are you still there? Hello? I think she dropped her connection, Matthew. Okay, thanks, Gladys. Um, so we might we might just come back to that question when oh when she's are you are you okay. back? I'm back. Uh, I'm okay. Sorry. Do you want to my, my internet connection? So my question again is with respect to the use of comparative uh, uh, law as a methodology in teaching environmental law? Because are you doing it in the bachelor degree or JD or in the uh, graduate school of law? Because in the Philippine setting, you know, I've been trying to apply for a teaching position in a law school, but I'm very, very clear that I didn't want to teach um, a bar subject because I wanted to more focus on assisting students to do scholarly work. But again, and I'm not applying in a Manila-based school. I wanted to go on a provincial school so I can encourage students to do comparative law and then publish work. But of course, there are very limited opportunities for lawyers who wanted to do a development uh, practice on environmental law. They wanted a professor who will prepare their students to pass the bar exam. So in your experience, how are you doing it? Thank you. Should I take it or uh, yep, maybe her or Jonathan could also? Please, Nipu. Okay. And then. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that is a particular problem, you know, because even in undergrad in uh, India, we have classroom size of 50 students, you know, out of which uh, most people would be interested in practicing environmental law. Uh, and maybe few would be interested in research and all of that. That's a, uh, That's the prevailing issue, actually. But I think, uh, for example, you know, Jonathan, I think did a syllabus development workshop with you and I had asked, uh, requested ladies to, she shared with me the syllabus. I don't know at what level the syllabuses were pitched at, but one of the syllabuses had rights of nature and they had all these really interesting case law from across jurisdiction, you know. But I think it's not necessary that only people, I mean, only students, if you want to pitch it to for research students or you know, would be interested in a more comparative law, this thing. I mean, even in practice of law, wouldn't uh, environmental lawyers benefit if they knew what was happening in other jurisdictions? So I think uh, that would be, because at least in India, what is happening in Delhi is that more and more uh, advocacy. So even writing up briefs, uh, the kind of judgments we are getting involves uh, references to what is happening in other jurisdictions. So I think uh, it also helps in the practice of law if you populate your syllabuses with references from develop, uh, of developments uh, in other jurisdictions. So I don't think it's only related to research. It would also help in advocacy. So that's my uh, my understanding of it. So Jonathan or Haneem, would you like to um, add your experience, Haneem? May I go first, uh, Jonathan? Um, Matthew, yeah? Please. Okay. Um, I think back to your main question, um, 
as to whether uh, comparative law, environmental law is being taught at the undergraduate or postgraduate level. Now, in my experience, well, I, I embed them in both, but how much you embed them depends really on the understanding of the students, because at the under, undergraduate level, you know, they're, they're beginning to understand, they're beginning to learn and remember things, you know, at, at, at the very inception of environmental law in Malaysia, that is. So in, in, in for them to, to make comparisons, um, I don't normally give them um, um, extensive work, um, like how I would give to postgraduate students, because postgraduate students, they are already at that level where they understand the basics of environmental law. Right. So now the next step is actually to use that information, that knowledge, and to take examples or illustrations from another country and to see where, you know, where they stand with each other. But it depends on how much you, you wish to achieve in your, like I said, in your learning goals, in your content of your, your, your course. So it depends really, you know, whether, because it depends on, on, this, on the areas as well. Um, for such as myself, climate change, I embed that within my undergraduate. And of course, it's a big thing in postgraduate uh, program, right? You know, it would be like a, a topic on climate change. But climate change in itself is embedded in every single aspect of environmental law. Um, you cannot ignore the fact that, you know, it, 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 it arises in the issue of transportation, agricultural, forestry, energy and the likes. And when you talk about the development of environmental law in Malaysia, in my experience, I tend to connect the two dots. And I tend to, you know, get some perspective from other countries as well. Um, not too much of it under, uh, in, in the, at the undergraduate level, but more so in the postgraduate level. Um, that's how I do it. Um, it depends on how much you wish to, you know, uh, uh, ask the students to gain in terms of that aspect. Jelly. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to? Um, yeah, actually, and I can answer, I can give a comment on that. And I, I also wanted to make point out a fatal flaw in the previous uh, answer uh, regarding the idea of a regional council. Um, but um, so in regarding the comparative research component, so with respect to Myanmar, there was sort of this larger mission of trying to promote uh, critical analysis, uh, freedom of inquiry, uh, and these kinds of things. So it was almost a necessity to encourage students uh, and teachers, incidentally, uh, to develop skills and, and research. But you know, there's there are different meanings of research. So you know, given the constraints of uh, the infrastructure constraints, the classroom constraints, and all the other constraints, I wasn't expecting students to do like ten thousand word research essays or you know teachers to be doing that kind of academic scholarly work instead when we were talking about research was that if they went out and started working at a law firm a, a particularly a international law firm what would be what were the skills that they needed to display right that you know they had to be able to go on the internet you know identify the difference between a, a spurious a spurious source or a questionable source versus a legitimate versus a legitimate source um, the, the kinds of places that specialize in legal information as opposed to just news media, the difference between academic sources versus, you know, uh, uh, practitioner sources, you know, those kinds of things. And so quite often it was just simply assignments at the most when we talked about research uh, being, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things that you would do for 3000 word memo that you would submit in a law firm, you know, something like that. Um, and real quick, just regarding the idea of a regional council, I certainly support the idea in principle, and I, I, you know, the idea of having these these regional regional specific networks of, of colleagues who can uh, share and exchange resources. And to some degree, the Academy of Environmental Law has been trying to do that. I'm, I'm sure Lisa is somewhere in the audience about to have a fit, um, so I will acknowledge that. Um, but the reason that ultimately failed in Myanmar's case um, was in Myanmar, uh, all everything was centralized all faculty are civil servants. And so in order for them to get permission to participate in any kind of networking, uh, collaboration, communication with foreigners, there was a six month approval process that had to come directly from the Minister of Education. 
Um, and so that also meant that they couldn't travel to workshops outside the country without six months, more than six months advance notice. They couldn't attend a workshop in the country without six months advance notice. Um, they were not allowed to travel on their personal passports. They had to be go on government issued passports, which were then confiscated as soon as they returned to the country. And any activities that they engaged in when outside the country had to be documented and submitted on a record to the, to the, to the government. Uh, so that was on file somewhere. So it basically discouraged any kind of engagement or communication. Um, online formats might have some potential. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's an alternative. One thing though, and this is my extreme concern, and this is something ADB needs to be mindful of. Uh, it depends on who you're inviting into this regional collaboration. Um, the, uh, a number of the faculty, Myanmar faculty that ADB and the Academy of Environmental Law engaged uh, were moles. And when the military coup occurred in February, 2021, they became active and uh, became informants. And they turned in the names of all of their colleagues to the military. And so um, there's one, there are two people in particular at the University of Yangon who were responsible for uh, 81 of their colleagues getting arrested. Um, and that, you know, I actually had the document. Uh, so it's, there was no denial of this. It actually has the signatures on it. Um, so it's a situation where uh, you have to be incredibly careful as to who you're involving and who you're including. And there's always that danger that the person you're working with is a spy uh, and they're just waiting for the military to show up and then the, boom, they become active. Uh, this is a real game. It's a real game. Jonathan, one, one hopes that the, um, the coup in Myanmar is not um, you know, adopted in other countries across the region, but um, your point is well taken. Uh, I mean, I, I should also point out that things had changed enormously um, in that, um, you know, just two days before the coup, um, the ADB Training the Teachers Program, we had launched um, a new project with the support of the Ministry of Education and the Director Generals of the relevant departments um, on, an, on a new environmental law curriculum for Myanmar, um, because the Myanmar um, education, Legal Education Board had adopted uh, environmental law as a, as a compulsory subject. Again, all of that stopped um, in, in February this year. Um, and as Jonathan says, you know, the consequences for those academics um, who have participated, and I think it, it's participated in the rule of law, um, as opposed to whether they've participated in any particular um, projects. Um, but yes, very, very clear. Um, and I think that that's also one of those issues that, you know, in terms of academic freedom, uh, in terms of the right of publication and the, the right of research, you know, these are all things that uh, are always um, subject to you know, some some challenge. And and I think it, it is also right to note that that's not just in, in Myanmar. Um, we also just have a question from Professor Galahad. Um, yes, please, would you like to open the microphone and... Yes, I, I, I just would like to ask if teaching styles uh, in Europe and the US would be applicable to Asian students because uh, uh, students are very different in these jurisdictions. Um, let me point out some differences. Um, those in the US are rather aggressive and assertive with their rights. In Asia, they are passive. Law professors are kings in their classrooms. And also, uh, I have noticed this. Uh, with respect to the, the study styles of students, in the United States, there is an emphasis on proper outlining and use of blue book, as well as the answering format. Um, there is also, the students there are also more receptive with respect to research work. Now, I, I can only talk about the Philippines uh, for my part, because um, my observation is that uh, um, there is, outlining is good. And I think most Asian students, or at least the Philippines, should, should concentrate on outlining and, and, and proper blue booking, and uh, a focus also on uh, answering styles. Now, here in the Philippines also, there is a bias against research. 
And this is not the fault also of the students. Even teachers are at fault because if we're going to look at this, in the thesis requirement, most law schools have ditched the thesis in their JD curriculum. So, uh, so you, you know, uh, uh, not many students volunteer to do uh, uh, research work with their law journals, law reviews. So my question is if, if we should adopt some innovations and how we can go about doing this. Thank you very much, um, Professor Gahad. Really interesting points. Um, Jonathan, in terms of your experience, perhaps in Australian um, universities or, or the US, and, and maybe also um, Nepal, you could talk about um, you know, Indian students, um, you know, if we can generalize so much, or and, and, and Malaysian students um, in terms of, especially those who are uh, studying environmental law, they may be a, a different breed, I don't know. But Jonathan, um, in terms of commenting on Professor Galahad's observations, yeah, and I fully agree, right, that there are very clear cultural differences um, and the kinds of things that you would expect or see in an American or Australian classroom is not going to be the same as you see in, in, um, in Myanmar, Thailand, you know, Cambodia, these kinds of places. Um, I, I will, however, say that, again, um, this does tie in with what, what is the larger mission of environmental law or, or teaching environmental law. And I, I was lucky in Myanmar in the sense that um, uh, when I first started teaching at University of Yangon, um, my, my cousins had invited the parents of my students to dinner uh, before we started the semester. And the parents had a direct conversation with me about the expectations for my teaching, um, which, but that was actually a very good thing. Again, so social networks, family networks in Asia are everything. <laughs> and I was actually very fortunate because the parents told me that the reason that they were very happy that I was um, teaching was that I could deliver an American style classroom that was sensitive to local, uh, local culture. That, that I knew what boundaries to not to not cross, right? Um, and that they actually told me that they wanted their children to experience the full-on American uh, uh, classroom setting. And so, you know, that was the first time the students told me that uh, the a teacher had ever asked them for their opinion and refused to 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 do anything until they had actually delivered an answer. And I remember I had students who were hiding like this uh, fr from me. And I was actually having to pull the book and the, the paper away to, to actually have them look at me and to answer my questions. Um, but I, I had that as a shield. I, I, I could say that, look, uh, your parents asked me to give you an American style experience. <laughs> so I am different than your other teachers. And within the space of this classroom, this is what I'm delivering. And the purpose, and this is probably the most important thing, the purpose was, this is helping you get a job with an international NGO, right? Because these are the kinds of skills that you need if you want to work for a foreign um, organization and most importantly, get better pay. And, and by constantly playing on that message, that gave me a little bit of breathing room uh, in terms of what was possible. So yeah, but thanks. Uh, can I add on to that, Matthew, please? Please. I, I share the same sentiment with Jonathan. You know, um, I, I do agree that uh, I'm speaking um, from my experience teaching Malaysian students and Indonesian students. Um, you know, when we, especially when we have this online teaching, goodness me, you know, it's, it's challenging because at the end of every lecture, you would expect questions. Right. What um, you know, during face to face classes, we, we already having uh, um, problems of getting enough questions at the end of the lecture. What more with online teaching? But at the end of the day, it depends on the teacher. And I applaud Jonathan because, uh, you know, Asian students in general. Yeah, in general, I think I speak for Malaysians. <clears throat> we tend to be passive, um, Professor Galahad, and that it's rightly so. So the thing is. It's up to us to push them beyond boundaries a little bit. Yeah, maybe Jonathan, you know, look them in the eye and, you know, but what I do is um, I normally um, 
actually I throw a pen at them. This is what I do in class. This is what I normally, or, or, or you know, it used to be feather duster, but now I throw a pen at them. Just to, you know, make them feel aware that this is an ongoing issue. This is something that affects us every single day, every minute of the day. Because environmental law in Malaysia, at the very least, unlike in the Philippines, we do not have any constitutional right to a healthy environment. People take environment as a, well, you know, it's the environment. Yeah, so what, right? And, and that is something that the educators need to, to change. And one of the ways is doing it through teaching. And that has to be at the very top of our minds whenever we teach our, our, our students that we need to change the mindset. And we need for them to make them aggressive like the, 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 the students in the United States. Probably they're born in a different you know, um, scenario, environment and culture and likewise. Um, you know, we are Asians, we have come up with certain values, right? And therefore, speaking out is something that is not done, Matthew, you know, in this parts of the world, right? Um, so it is, it's, it's a challenge, but we need to change it. We as teachers must have that, um, you know, that, that thing in mind that we need to make sure the students are equipped enough to live, you know, uh, beyond our shores and I rightly so Jonathan you know I always tell my students you need to be this like this and this you need to be um, hardy right in order for you to be in the multinationals whatever that may be in the international community you need to be hardy and you, you have to impart all this other soft skills or whatever skills that you know apart from the academic skills you need to impart other things as well so that's very, very important, I think, for, at least for myself, when I educate my students in environmental law class. Um, you know, but, but it's, it's really up to the individual teachers, uh, Professor Galahad. You know, some teachers I know, they don't really care. You know, they just go, oh yeah, okay, five, 10 minutes of lecture and da, 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 we give you the assignment and okay, now that's, that's, that's the day, goodbye, and that's it. No, we have to do something just more than just teaching. Um, that's from my perspective, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that Nepo? question. Thank you, Hanim. Nepo, please. Uh, so very quickly, Professor Galahad, I think uh, two things that I have uh, in my experience have worked. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, like in terms of assessments. So at the end of the term assessments, we don't have much choice in India in terms of, a, you know, full-fledged question paper kind of thing. But in terms of uh, midterm assessments, what we can do is give the students a choice. Like if they want to write a reflection paper on a research article, or they want to take a more objective type exams. So there will be students who would opt for a more reflection paper, more oriented towards research. So that's one way of actually, you know, uh, giving that student a choice and kind of identifying students who are more interested in research. The other uh, thing that has, uh, that I've seen over a couple of years is that Students are uh, not only interested in internships in organization, usually it's law firms that you know, their people are interested in. But now we see more and more students being interested in doing inter research internships, uh, internships under professors or uh, researchers. And that's, there's also a reason for that because most of the students are going in for master's courses, uh, programs abroad. So in their SOPs, they want to write that they've done this kind of research or whatever. So that's a kind of a, application differentiator in a way. So there is more uptake from the student community on research, therefore. And I think research internships is something we've seen more and more happening. Students being interested in working as research assistants to professors. So that's, that's from my... So thank you, um, Dr. Nepur, Dr. Haneem, Dr. Jonathan, thank you very much for a, a, a very extraordinary and in-depth sort of presentations and discussions. And I think from our perspective, um, we wanted to end sort of our formal uh, Philippine Legal Education Board training process with our environmental law academics and colleagues with highlighting, you know, that these challenges and opportunities and the real, I think, both the commonalities across the region um, and also the differences. Um, but I think if I can sort of take a sort of a key message um, from Hanim and Nabur and, and Jonathan and, and really from 
perhaps the last uh, 10 weeks is the two things we need to put into the classroom um, for environmental law teaching. Um, one is students to make it a bit more student focused um, to ensure that we're actually provide, making sure that our teaching um, meets their expectations, needs, and indeed the way students learn these days. And I think harkening back to sort of the discussions that uh, Professor Amanda and other, others of our professors talked about, that students learn differently now, both online through the post-pandemic or current pandemic, but also just the way they've grown up. So the students really have to be a bit more central in our, in our teaching. But secondly, as we're environmental lawyers, the subject matter, the environment, the planet, the future, that is something that we really have to bring into the classroom um, because it is essentially the thing that really, really matters. Um, you know, I have to say always, you know, I'm privileged to be working and to be surrounded and have many conversations with amazing environmental law academics and professionals uh, and meet many amazing environmental law students. And it's a great privilege. Uh, it's been a great privilege to have you here with us today. Um, and more importantly, it's a great privilege uh, for all of our um, uh, as current students, our academics, uh, to be here with us. And I, on that note, I would like to turn back to Mary. Uh, and again, thank you, Nabor and, and Haneem and Jonathan, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you very much. To our Thanks very speakers. much. Thank you. So um, I guess that ends our question and answer. And um, we will now proceed to the awarding of the certificates to our resource speakers for today. So the Legal Education Board presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Jonathan Lajovlad, Associate Professor, Australia National University, for sharing his time, knowledge, and expertise as resource speaker during the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program, 10th Session Environmental Law Asia, Environmental Law Academics Panel from SA Opportunities for Comparative Law, held via Zoom virtual conference and given the first day of December in the year of our Lord 2021 in Manila. Signed on behalf of the board by our chairperson, Anna Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. With the same citation, the Legal Education Board also award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Hanim Kamar Harudin, the Deputy Dean for Academic Affairs of University of Kebangsan, Malaysia. Also, for her very um, substantive lecture for today's session and for sharing her time with us today. Um, given this the first day of December in the year of our Lord, um, 2021 in Manila and signed also by our chairperson, Ana Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. Lastly, we award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Nupur Chaudhary, Assistant Professor of Law for Center for the Study of Law and Governance, Jawar Halal Nehru University in New Delhi, India, for sharing her time, knowledge, and expertise as resource speaker for today's session. Um, key ideas and um, enhancement for teaching environmental law. We will now be having a five minute break and we expect our participants to be back um, at around 11, 10, 52. So kindly join us back again after five minutes. Thank you everyone. Um, so uh, we're heading into our closing session. Uh, and so we have, um, before we're going to ask our um, uh, supporters to provide some closing statements, um, we thought we'd have a, a general closing session. And we've also provided um, a word cloud um, for people to use um, on the Mentimeter. Um, and if you click in the link uh, that I've just shared, in the um, uh, in the chat box, we've asked if you um, want to enter a word as part of your or, or a comment as part of your key takeaways um, from the training program. Um, and so, after we've 
concluded this short session will will then allow people to um, uh, see the, the word cloud and it could be just a word um, how you're feeling um, how you think the training was um, some idea or thought that that um, helps you remember um, some of the sessions that we've done over the over the last 10 weeks um, so if you want to type one word or a, a short two word phrase uh, and then press submit um, that will then go into the um, the word cloud but we'd also um, be very happy to take any sort of comments or feedbacks if anyone would like to put their uh, hand up um, for any comments um, as part of just a sort of a closing session and our feedback on on anything that you'd like to raise um, uh, for um, the organizers or um, a comment that you feel uh, is important that we, we need to address or things that we need to look at. Um, these are things that we're very keen to see um, over the next and, and get your feedback um, as well as the feedback form uh, that has been shared um, with you um, on, on today. Um, and we're very interested to see, you know, whether this was a beneficial process for you, whether you thought that um, the topics were covered and how you um, could um, experience and react uh, to some of the materials, both in terms of the pedagogy, as well as the substantive materials that were provided along the way. So is there anyone that would like to, to share an observation or a thought um, uh, with uh, their colleagues um, before we uh, go into our closing um, session? Please. My name is uh, Amado Tolentino, and uh, I sort of pioneered in this field in the country. And when I learned about this session, I was uh, really expecting a lot. For the reason that I had to admit my environmental launch 2000 years ago. But what touched me and what made me attend almost all the sessions, I was absent only once because of uh, electrical connections problem, is because I really want to suffer, because I really felt very heavy, in the sense that uh, during the years that I was uh, working for UNEP and UNESCO as consultant, and in all the meetings that I was uh, invited in Asia Pacific in particular, I always say, on the part of the Philippines, especially, that I look forward that there will be a time that there will be a cadre of Philippine lawyers in the field of environmental law. And I think this is the opportunity for me to congratulate all of you, especially realizing that I love of our young lawyers are in the different islands. And uh, many of them are connected with NGOs. That for me is something really very important for the Philippines. I would uh, convey to you again my congratulations and my feeling of relief at this development in environmental law as a profession or as a subject in Philippine law schools. We worked on this for quite some time and we were only successful in having UP law school to adopt it. And that was how many years ago? That was during the 1990s. And uh, we were not discouraged. Uh, I, I recall that uh, it was UP accepted it or adopted it as a two-unit uh, course and optional at that. 
that it became compulsory with some was something for me or for us in the film also. And so once again, congratulations to all of you in the NCR Law Schools, as well as in the provinces. And uh, I would like to thank also the sponsors, ADB and uh, also LEB. And uh, thank you also, Matthew, for uh, guiding us at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I must say, as someone who studied law in environmental law in Sydney University in 1988, and I, I mentioned this, um, my law lecturer who has now passed away, Nicola Franklin, she was a, you know, a truly outstanding and passionate uh, lecturer on environmental law and administrative law. So I, I think in relation to the, the comment that you, that you made there, all of us are, owe a debt, an enormous debt to those who years ago, decades ago, started us on this journey. Um, and I think it is exciting that here we are, 30 odd years, 20 odd years later, that we have such a, a huge cadre and, and, and group of, of passionate and committed environmental law professors, but we should always recognise those who, who have gone before, who have blazed the trail. Um, and we're very pleased, I think, to have a lot of great people here um, who have been with us also for the training program. So thank you very much for your kind words. Um, is there anyone else? Please feel free to, to share or to, to, to share comments. Um, Professor Galahad, please. Yeah, uh, congratulations to everybody. Uh, we thank uh, Matthew for uh, seeing, seeing us through this uh, training. Uh, what I can only say is this. Uh, years ago, I think 2007, 2008, uh, Professor Tony Oposa came up with an association of lawyers and, and we met somewhere in, in Tagaytay. So probably in the near future when, when conditions improve, uh, we all of us can associate together and form our own uh, union or organization. Uh, probably it will be good to see all of us or our an association of environmental law, lawyers filing, uh, being uh, an amicus of the Supreme Courts in important environmental cases so that uh, we can finally uh, use environmental law for the good of everybody. Thanks to everybody and to Matthew, to the Legal Education Board, Comjojo, thank you. Please, uh, Remelisa Moraledo. Yes, um, good morning, everyone. This is already actually my third year of attending this training. Matthew, do you still remember those two um, years yes. in Cebu? And um, I am, every time at the end of the training, I am always scared. And, um, I am, of course, thankful to the Legal Education Board, to everyone at ADB, to IUCN, and to all the people who make this possible. Uh, thank you very much. And um, of course, I am also very thankful for the, the, the growing network of environmental lawyers that this training creates. It's really very inspiring to see that we are um, already growing this this mass of of lawyers who really have sincere love for the environment thank you very much thank you indeed and i i do hope one day we can get back to a, a new cebu uh, or a new workshop in, in person in, in the philippines is there anyone else who would like to to, to share, and I think Attorney Donna, um, Professor Donna, you, you've also identified that you know there are true true pioneers, um, and that we've been privileged to to be working with uh, and and who have attended our our workshop. So, so we have um, we now have the the word cloud. Um, and I have been um, trying to, to, to share the, um, the word cloud um, with us. It may take me a few moments um, to get the technology um, correct. I'm just wondering, um, Gladys, I, I think I've sent the link 
through the, the Viber chat. I'm just wondering if that's something that um, can be picked up and, and shared um, through the screen. Is that able to, to be done? Oh, thanks, Gab. So here are some of the, the messages, um, informative, inspiring, uh, enlightening, collaboration, uh, experiential learning, um, challenge, immersive. Um, so lots of statements um, about and comp networking and comprehensive. That's uh, always exciting and a passion for teaching. Um, so look, thank you all um, very much indeed for your um, participation and presentation. And I would now like to hand back over to Mary um, for some of our concluding statements. Um, and I would just like to say thank you very much uh, to the team at the Legal Education Board um, and the ADB team. Uh, for me, um, without you, Mary, um, without you, Ralph, John, John. Uh, and Commissioner Jojo, uh, this would not have been possible. Um, and so we pay deep appreciation for the work that you have done in putting it all together. And to Mary, you have been an absolutely outstanding moderator over the last uh, 11 weeks. So, uh, Salamat Bo. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Matthew, for that. Also, on behalf of the Legal Education Board, we thank our participants, especially, particularly those who are very um, engaging and very um, active in supporting the programs of the Legal Education Board. So as we near the end of our training program, we would also like to take this opportunity for us, the organizers, to, take our dear, to thank our dear participants for your support and participation. We have with us to give us short messages from our partner organization. Okay, so to speak and give their closing message on behalf of the United Nations Environmental Program, we have Dr. Georgina Lloyd, Regional Coordinator, Station in the Pacific of Environmental Law and Governance for United Nations Environment Program. Good morning, Dr. Georgina. Good morning, Mary, and thank you very much for inviting me again to join this really important event. On behalf of UNEP, I just want to thank all the partners and all of the participants for joining this inaugural and, and really significant training for all law schools in the Philippines to train, uh, to provide the, the sort of curriculum to train upcoming lawyers in environmental law. I mean, we know through this series of, of weeks of, of, of sessions that not only is environmental law a core subject that should be part of the legal education of all students, but we desperately need more environmental lawyers. Uh, and the fact that the course now will be compulsory means that all of our lawyers can become environmental lawyers, which is really necessary for us to actually address these overwhelming environmental problems that we face. And while the Philippines, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, does face some of the greatest challenges when it comes to sustainable development, extraction of natural resources, and the protection of environmental advocates, it also has some of the greatest opportunities with some of the most comprehensive rules and environmental procedures for environmental cases with this fantastic endeavor to incorporate environmental law as a compulsory subject into all legal degrees or uh, law degrees. And also with the leadership and the passion that has been expressed by so many lawyers in the Philippines. Um, with Rosalisa now as, as head of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, of the growing number of law clinics that as we've discussed across the Philippines for this desire to really build this passion for environmental law amongst your students. I mean, there are so many wonderful opportunities and, and things to look forward to. So I really hope that in the coming years, not only will we have this groundswell of environmental lawyers, but we'll also start to see 
more cases being brought in the Philippines. We'll start to see some greater levels of accountability, some greater levels of, of public participation, of protection and promotion of citizens who seek to stand up for the environment. And, and we'll start to see more awareness, both amongst the public, but amongst legal stakeholders of the importance of upholding our rights to a balanced and healthful ecology, and also the rights of communities and citizens to both procedural and substantive environment, environmental rights. Um, so I'm very excited by this. And, and I think I want to thank all of you for participating and for becoming the champions, uh, the environmental law champions that, that ADB is, is really um, pioneering. So thank you to the Legal Education Board in the Philippines. Thank you very much to the Asian Development Bank and to all of my colleagues there. Thank you to the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law. And particularly, let me say uh, thank you to Matthew, thank you to Mary, uh, thank you to all of the lecturers who have taken their time across the region uh, to contribute to the depth of knowledge that has been shared over the last 10, 11 weeks. Um, so on behalf of UNEP, once again, uh, we're very happy and delighted to be part of this endeavor. And I really hope we can now replicate this uh, across other countries in the region. Thank you. Back to you, Mary. Thank you, Dr. Georgina. So we will now have on behalf of the Asian Development Bank to speak also in behalf of their senior 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 counsel, Christina Pak. We have Matthew, our very wonderful facilitator and moderator who has been with us from the day one. Um, let us hear from him the message from ADB. Um, th thank you very much indeed, um, Mary. And uh, unfortunately, I apologize on behalf of Christina Pack, who was just unable to attend through some technical issues. Um, I just don't, I want to close by echoing um, the words of Georgina Lloyd. Um, Georgie is also a passionate environmental uh, academic. Um, and her work with the UN Environment Program over the last two years has been uh, one that uh, deserves enormous credit. Um, I also want to acknowledge Rose Lisa um, for her leadership of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law um, and to acknowledge the extraordinary work of the Legal Education Board and Commissioner Joseph Tojo. You have been truly inspirational for us and more importantly, um, the joy that has happened uh, the work that has happened, the achievements we have done through collaboration and partnership. And I think that's one of the things about this environmental law training program is that it has been about collaboration and partnership. Ultimately, it is collaboration with you, the environmental law lecturers and academics of the Philippines who are entrusted with a very important task of teaching the next generation of environmental lawyers um, to protect and preserve the environment. Um, the Asian Development Bank and the uh, Law and Policy Reform Group um, has a number of projects, um, including a judicial training program, as well as the Train the Teachers program that have been ongoing. And this program has been uh, really a catalyst for more work that will be done in 2022, um, hopefully developing some environmental law curriculums and updating those in the Philippines. Uh, we've also launched a model environmental law curriculum program for the greater Mekong area. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Nepur said, uh, we're also helping uh, the universities in India in a South Asian research colloquium on environmental law and climate change law to start promoting Asian academic voices in um, modern international journals. Uh, and indeed, one of the things that I think we're all very proud about is acknowledging and recognizing the extraordinary work done by environmental lawyers in the Philippines, environmental academics in the Philippines and environmental judges in the Philippines. And it's so important for us to acknowledge the work that has been done in the Philippines, but also acknowledging that it's an ongoing and never ending process to ensure that we provide appropriate uh, environmental law training for our students, but also environmental law capacity building 
for environmental advocates, for the judiciary um, and for uh, academics. And so on that note, I would like to say thank you very much to our partners, the Legal Education Board, for your outstanding leadership in supporting and promoting and developing this course, um, to the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, um, and as always to the United Nations Environment Program for their outstanding support for this project. Uh, and in particular for, to Gladys, uh, Christina, uh, and to Angelo for the technical assistance in making this possible, um, without which uh, none of this uh, online work would, would occur. Um, and above all, again, thanks to Mary, um, John, uh, Gab, uh, for your uh, behind the scenes and your technical support uh, in ensuring that we have conducted, I think, the last 11 sessions with minimum of technical difficulties, um, but certainly providing a forum and an opportunity to discuss and enhance environmental law in the Philippines, but also in our region. Thank you very much, Salamat Paul, and we will see you hopefully next week. But on that note, I turn back to, to Mary. Thank you, Matthew. And then we will have um... Commissioner Josefi Sorarati on behalf of the Legal Education Board to speak and thank you all the participants. Commissioner Jojo. Hi, thank you, Mary. So my dearest classmates, today, yeah, we're classmates because I'm also learning a lot from this experience. Today reminds me of a quote from Winnie the Pooh and it goes like this, how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. I am going to miss all of you. We have been together for 12 Wednesdays, spanning three months, imagine three months. Parting is hard for me because we had a very moving, inspiring and passionate environmental journey together. You know, every time a session is over, I would say, wow, uh, I've learned a lot. And I thought that that would be the end of learning. But in every session as we went on, there is so much to learn. I have learned a lot and I'm certain that you have also been enriched by our 9 to 11 a.m. Wednesday hobby. I would like to give my thank yous to the wind beneath our wings, the team who is behind this program, the ADB team, that would be Matthew Baird, Gladys Cabanilla Sangalang, and Angelo Jacinto. And of course, to my dearest lab team, Attorney Mary, who has blossomed in this journey, Gab Matola and Ralph Luna. Thank you so much to this win. They're always there behind. Although you, you see Matthew and Mary uh, here, but I tell you the work that they do behind the scene is so immense and so great. And I thank these people, because without them, we wouldn't have this very enriching journey. I would also want to thank the person who planted the seed of this program. They are Attorney Tony Oposa, Attorney Lisa Osorio, Professor Galahad, and Professor Donna. Professor Galahad, thank you for taking the cudgels when environmental law was put at risk. You were so courageous and so passionate that you did not lose time in emailing me and saying, we have to make sure environmental law will be a mandatory subject in our law curriculum. Professor Galahad, thank you for that. The seed that you all planted, Attorney Tony, Attorney Lisa, Professor Galahad and Professor Donna, that seed that you planted bloom into this bountiful program because of the nurturing from the Asian Development Bank. And I thank the ADB General Counsel, Thomas Clark and Christina Pa. I also thank the International Union for Conservation of Nature Academy of Environmental Law, headed by our attorney Lisa. Attorney Lisa, thank you for always being there and for never leaving this, uh, this family. And the UN Environment and Program, Thank you, Dr. Georgina Lloyd, for your support. And of course, our resource speakers in the past and today, Jonathan, for giving us your story, and Dr. Doctor, and also Dr. Hanim and Dr. Nupur. Last but not the least, 
to all of you, my dear classmates, most especially to Professor Amado Tolentino. Professor Tolentino, thank you for sharing your what you have done for environmental law. I'm so happy that you spoke this morning because it is but loving for you to tell us where this journey started. Thank you for blazing that trail. For you, we owe a lot. Thank you, Professor Amado. I hope I could see you in person in the future. I want to hug you. I want to hug you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. To you, my dear classmates, thank you for accepting the invitation of the Legal Education Board to join us in this teaching and learning activity. This will just be a short parting, I promise you. I assure you, we will meet again. That is why I hope you will accomplish the reflective journal. The link is in the chat box because that journal will not just help you in your reflection and deepen your, your passion for environmental law, but also that journal will help us design our next, next teaching and learning activity for environmental law. We might not see each other every Wednesday after December 8. Yes, we still have December 8. Don't forget, although we're saying goodbye now, but we have an optional December 8. And if you're free, please be with us on December 8. Now, we might not be seeing each other every Wednesday after December 8, but always remember that we can continue our conversation through the Facebook account in Vilo Asia. It's also in the chat box, no? In Vilo Asia, if you haven't yet joined that Facebook group, please join. Look for the link in a chat box so that we can start the conversation there on how we are going to form our own organization as suggested by Professor Galahad and Professor Aris. Because we really, I believe we must have that family, you know, that family. And so I hope we continue the conversation. And thank you, thank you so much for journeying with the Legal Education Board in loving our home, our earth. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jojo. Thank you again to Matthew and thank you to Dr. Georgina Lloyd. We congratulate in advance all our participants who have finished at least eight of the 11 sessions of the training program. Again, we encourage our participants to join us on December 8th for the 11th session where we will be discussing good stories and environmental cases filed and won by fellow practitioners in environmental law. We will also be um, Reminding our participants who have yet to comply with the eighth session for the issuance of the certificates, we, we will encourage you to join us on December 8th. We are also happy to announce that we will be providing you with printed handouts of all the lectures and topics during this training program. We will be sending the, the, the handouts in your mailing address. So we will be requesting for you to provide us with your office or home address to be, to be sent to our mailer on Monday next week. I guess um, we will see each other on December 8th. So this is just uh, a short closing message. But on December 8th, we assure you that there will be a more substantive, uh, additional uh, substantive, substantive lectures to be discussed and ideas and knowledge to be shared. So join us for the 11th session. And again, congratulations to everyone. And thank you very much on behalf of ADB, Legal Education Board, IUCN, and, uh, and the UNEP. Again, thank you. Maraming maraming salamat po. <laughs>